All right. Well, thank you all so much for uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Dave Hebert. I am an associate professor of economics at Aquinas College and director of the Center for Markets, Ethics, and Entrepreneurship. Uh, we're joined tonight by uh, Dr. Daniel Smith of Middle Tennessee State University and the Political Economy Research Institute uh, to discuss his latest paper with uh, Macy Sheck called Good Distiller, Bad Distiller. Uh, Dan Smith is the author of God, probably 40 some odd uh, scholarly papers, but also two books that have come out in the last uh, year or so. Uh, the first, Money and the Rule of Law with Cambridge University Press, and then the second one, uh, The Political Economy of Public Pensions. Uh, so uh, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Smith and potentially his, uh, his son. So there we are. All right. Welcome. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I apologize. I am at home, so we might be interrupted a couple times. Um, that was Evelyn. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for having me, Dave. I'm very excited to be with you tonight. Um, this paper, um, this is the first time presenting it, so um, please bear with me. Um, and it's co-authored with Macy Sheck, who is a PhD student here. He's a first-year PhD student here at Middle Tennessee State University. Um, we have a great uh, developing program in public choice, um, and we provide fellowships through the Political Economy Research Institute for students interested in political economy. So if you're ever interested in pursuing economics as a career. Um, it is a fantastic career. Um, please consider our program. Uh, our, you know, we have great travel supplements and great resources, and we're about 45 minutes outside of Nashville, so it's a great location, and we have really good faculty to work with. And we do cool research like this on whiskey. So to just start us off, um, you know, there, there's a whole literature on institutional filters. And that is that, let me minimize some stuff here so I can see it, um, that the, the, the structure of incentives and the flow of information um, are, that are set by institutions. So institutions are the rules of the game. So think like the rules of the game that we have the markets and rules of the game that we have for government and rules of the game that we have for the academy. Those uh, structure how we behave and can alter our behavior as the rules change. So if you think about like, um, you know, this is an example that Pete Betke, um, you know, my dissertation advisor used. He changed the rules of basketball and you made the, the net um, much lower, like three feet off the ground. Um, you'd have a different, the play would be different, the recruitment of players would be different, the entire strategy would be different if you changed um, just even sometimes some slight variations in the rules. Um, so even the same actors under different sets of rules can behave in widely divergent uh, manners. Um, and that could even influence our moral behavior. So the same people under different institutions can actually take drastically different behavior that could be uh, judged moral or um, immoral um, based upon the context. And there's, a, there's a, also a growing literature of scholars interested in the, how, how markets affect our morality, uh, especially as compared to governments. Um, so there is, um, you know, there's a literature suggesting that markets are morally corrupting, um, that interacting in the market um, requires, you know, encourages greed and self-interest, um, and therefore, therefore um, discourages cooperation and development of moral character and tolerance and the such. But there's another um, uh, strand of, of, of literature that's emerging that suggests that markets can actually encourage virtuous behavior. So some of these, some of this literature actually goes and does experiments on um, primitive societies ar around the world, and especially ones that have had various exposure to markets. And they play little uh, economic games with them and see to determine how self-interested they behave. And the finding in this literature is actually the more exposure to markets people have, the more moral they behave. So the more virtue, virtue they, uh, uh, that they have in their interactions, the le less narrowly self-interested they are when they engage in these economic games. Um, there's a, one of the, the first papers I cite here um, actually primes people before playing a game. So what they do is they prime them with uh, market words and people that are primed with market words actually behave more honestly in the subsequent game than those that were not primed by market words. Um, 
And Stora Choi have a have, have a, a fantastic new book that I highly recommend. Do markets corrupt our morals? Going through uh, the entire um, empirical literature on this and make a fairly compelling case that not only do markets encourage moral behavior, but they actually are moral training grounds that make us better people. And you can kind of think about this. This goes all the way back to the do commerce thesis of Adam Smith and David Hume, that um, to engage in commerce, if I want to trade with someone, I have to earn their trust. So I have to I have to behave in a, a virtuous manner. I you know if I'm dishonest with them, then I lose all future chances of conducting business with them and anyone that they go on and tell. So it hurts my reputation. So even if I'm just being self interested, I'm going to develop um, honesty and respect for my trading partners. And what I found with my dissertation, which was um, kind of based on this Jew commerce thesis, is I looked at medieval Spain where Jews, Christians, and Muslims were in, engaging in trade with each other and at a time when um, you know the, these different religions were experiencing extreme um, hostility towards one another. And in medieval Spain, when they're trying to do business with each other, they would actually adopt each other's practices. So if I if you know if, if you were a Christian and you're trying to engage in commerce with a Muslim and they would invite you to their daughter's wedding. So you'd go to their religious ceremony. And there would actually, you'd start adopting each other's cultural practices, and you'd actually form real meaningful relationships with these people that you otherwise would have never done so, um, be just because you were led to initially just uh, out of pursuit of profit to um, establish an initial relationship with them. Um, so there, there is a literature on this. You can also think of like the, the Reader's Digest survey where they um, are an experiment where they go around the world's top, you know, biggest cities and they leave a wallet laying out or they see, um, or they have an old lady trying to open a door and they see in which cities are you more likely to see someone return the wallet and in which cities are you more likely to see someone help that old lady open the door. And of course, um, with, without um, question each year, very consistently, consistently, the center of, or the, the, the place most known for, for returning the wallet and for helping the old lady open the door is the center of greedy capitalism, New York City. Um, so it's um, there. There is a lot of empirical, growing empirical uh, literature looking at this, but there there is certainly a contention, to say the least. So there are, you know, essentially it's philosophers versus economists on this issue. Um, so I want to address this literature by looking at um, the behavior of um, early American whiskey markets. And I think it's really relevant to look at because. Whiskey is kind of unique, especially at this time, in that it's a credence good, which means it's very difficult for consumers to um, determine the quality of the product. So in this, it's very much like um, some healthcare products, like you know, your doctor subscribes or prescribes some pills. Well, you actually don't know the science behind it. Most of us don't know the science behind it. Um, and there's the, the placebo effect. So you actually may not know if the pill is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. Or you might not know if a, a, if, if a surgeon recommends a surgery, whether it's actually necessary or not, right? So in economic speak, there's an asymmetric information problem. The, per, the practitioner has a lot of information about what is actually needed and what the product is and the quality of it, but the person buying it does not. Same thing with like a, a plumber. Whenever a plumber comes to my house to fix a problem, I have no idea what they're talking about and if it's actually necessary or not. Um, so it's really hard to get that information, especially you know in a time before um, you know Google and the internet. And it also has some attributes of experience good. Experience good is a good that's hard to discern the quality of until you interact with it, and then you can. Um, so whiskey, there are some aspects of whiskey, especially. Um, as I talk about in the paper, as distillers develop distinct characteristics that turn it into an experience good. There's also a profit opportunity for rectifiers. So rectifiers are, are um, people that at this time that buy up neutral spirits, so just plain alcohol with no flavoring, and then they either um, they, they age it, they flavor it, um, they modify it in some capacity in order to fit the uh, flavor for a profile of their consumers. The thing is, is that they can buy up cheap neutral spirits and then put in cheap um, flavoring substances, and they can even put in dangerous substances and then sell that onto consumers that are unaware that they're um, getting cheapened artificially flavored whiskey that could actually be dangerous to them. And the third reason is, is that they're operating a market where um, they're self-selecting into a, a disreputable business. 
especially at that time, um, whiskey was seen as, as very much a vice, still is today, um, but even more so back then. Um, so the people distilling were dishonest people, self-selecting as dishonest people already. So it, if it's really telling if these dishonest people um, in their behavior in the market or in politics operate differently than um, you would expect them to behave as, dis as people engaged in a dishonest business. So let me give you a, a brief history of early American uh, whiskey markets. Um, new technology starting around um, 1840s, 1850s, 1860s um, allowed for whiskey to be manufactured by, uh, as we would think, uh, like industrialized, um, mass produced. Um, prior to that, it was produced by you know, local farmers. Every town had several people um, making whiskey, um, oftentimes unbranded. Um, so there's this big change in, in, in how it was produced. Um, and that uh, fit with the, the growing demand for whiskey at, uh, among Americans at that time. Um, and as I mentioned, it was either produced straight, which is it was produced as, as we would normally think as you buy whiskey today. In most contexts, you, you buy the whiskey from a, a single distiller and they're the ones that, that uh, manufactured it and they aged it. And that's what gave it the flavor profile, the appearance, the taste. Uh, or the, the smell, and um, that was considered the natural way to, to distill whiskey. And then, as I mentioned, the rectifiers who would artificially flavor the whiskey. And in their market behavior, what we found, what I find, what we find is that the, the distillers, while they wanted to engage in dishonest behavior and attempt, and there are several attempts to, largely, um, through competitive pressures, they were actually um, forced to behave virtuously. So they actually had to develop mechanisms just to stay in business that assured consumers of quality and thereby drove the, the people making bad whiskey out of the market. And the market mechanisms they developed were distinct characteristics of the whiskey. They developed brand names. That's a pretty obvious one. They leveraged, leveraged the reputation of local sellers. They developed advertisements and guarantees. And then they also um, innovated the uh, use of, of sealed glass bottles to sell their whiskey to consumers. So I'm gonna go through each one of these. So the distinctive characteristics, um, it was pretty clear early on, initially whiskey was sold unbranded and it was sold as per where it came from, which signified the, the flavor and taste and appearance profi profile that it should have. So Lincoln County whiskey, which is what you would traditionally think nowadays is Tennessee whiskey. So think Jack Daniels, George Diskel, uh, Dickel, um, Nelson Greenbrier, uh, where it has a distinct um, sweetness to it because it's been um, filtered through uh, char uh, maple charcoal and it's made with lime water. So the, the, the distilling process itself in that geographical area uh, created a distinct flavor profile and appearance that made it obvious that that, um, that that whiskey was of higher quality. And that process, the filtering through charcoal maple, maple made the, the whiskey um, more pure and better off. So it's very clear early on that in, in advertisements, they were, they were specifically advertising the, the, these distinct characteristics. You also saw in Kentucky, the, 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 what we call now is, is, is bourbon, uh, it was started, the, it's a little bit off because it actually wasn't started in Bourbon County, uh, Kentucky, but that's where it got its name was from Bourbon County. I know it's a weird quirk in, in uh, Bourbon history, but it was a county near there. And so that whiskey ended up being called Bourbon that was aged in um, charred uh, oak barrels. So that had a unique flavor profile. You also had um, Eastern Rye Whiskey. Uh, that was advertised as such. So it wasn't brand names, it's just advertised as um, the specific uh, dis distillation process. And that would inform customers, hey, this is, the, this is what you should expect when you experience this whiskey. And if it was otherwise, then you would um, automatically suspect that there um, was some, some shenanigans going on or your dealer was trying to fraud you in, in, some, in some manner. So they developed these unique characteristics specifically to um, ensure consumers of, of the quality of their product. And when um, new distillers opened up, they would oftentimes latch on to this. They would say, okay, 
we're starting up a new distillery in Eastern Tennessee, and we're going to adopt the Lincoln County process. And here's how we're going to do it. And we're importing the technology directly from this distillery. Um, so it's pretty clear that they were, um, you know, new distillers were trying to latch onto that to ensure quality to consumers. And part of this was they also started developing age statements. Initially, they didn't actually say, you know, this is age 10 years, this is age four years. It was just old and new. So you commonly see in, in advertisements at this time that we're selling Lincoln County whiskey, both old and new. And of course, the old, meaning that it was aged in a barrel um, much longer, um, went for much higher prices than the, the, the new whiskey. Um, so you see these specific age statements also as a indicator of quality to consumers. Um, if any of you have, you know, drink whiskey, especially scotch, you know that the longer it's aged, the better it is, and you can taste it in the in the flavor. Um, so it becomes another distinct way to to ensure consumers of quality is, hey, we're just, you know, we're a major manufacturer, and we're going to let our product age a lot a lot longer. Um, Jack Daniels was one of the first ones to actually put an age statement on their um, their whiskey bottle. Um, there's an adver advertisement from 1904 that says, hey, we age our whiskey for seven years. We're the first ones to do it, so we're going to put it. And that's why um, the advertisement said why it says number old number seven at the top of their bottle. Um, the next mechanism they developed was brand names. And this is pretty obvious, um, you know, Brand names um, uh, are a way for, for companies to have a uh, uh, reputation um, and to build that up. You interact with brand names all the time. It makes it easier to shop. You're like, okay, I'm going in and buying this product manufactured by this company because I know their, their, uh, their specific quality. It makes it really easy, especially when you're traveling, right? You, you, move, you go to a different town, you, you know hotels, you know the, 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 the food around there. You can be like, okay, I, I know what this that company is. I know what their quality is. Well, it's the same thing with whiskey. Um, uh, the, the, initially, it was just local reputation, but what they did is they build, built those names, George Jickle, Jack Daniels, um, Evan Williams, up into name brands that had associated trademarks, and they were actually um, registering these trademarks before trademark registration. And what the, how they did this is they um, put it in trade books for the, for the, the, the liquor business. And so they put set property rights for it, say, okay, here's our, here's our, our trademark. No one else should use it. And then they would actually sue people that would um, uh, appropriate that um, uh, trademark name or try to do something close to that, even before the government was enforcing uh, trademark laws. Um, the first trade, the brand name that I found in advertisement was um, OFC in 1874, and then Nelson's Greenbrier in 1893. Um, and like I said, then the brand name started issuing um, age statements after that as well. Um, so that was an important development so they could sell their product beyond just their local geographic uh, region. A uh, very interesting um, mechanism that they adopted was that they would leverage the reputation of local sellers. And so, you know, most people bought their whiskey from either a local dealer, like a grocer, or a local uh, pharmacist at that time. Um, so what these distillers did was they'd make exclusive arrangements with one of the dealers in that town, kind of give them a local monopoly, but that was a way to assure consumers that that was the, the pure product, because those people could advertise, hey, we got it, we're the, the exclusive dealers for this distiller in this community, no one else can sell it, um, so therefore, and we have a, a, a direct relationship with the distiller, and everything we sell is guaranteed to come directly from them. Um, so that's a way to assure, ensure consumers that it was actually the genuine product being sold. Um, and this is really important at this time because um, I, I failed to mention that whiskey was sold out of barrels at this time. Um, so up until essentially, you know, late um, 19th century, early um, um, 20th century, um, whiskey was sold by the barrel from the distiller. And then the dealer themselves would just, people would bring in their own like jug and scoop it out. And that's how it was sold. So it was really easy for a local dealer to cut the whiskey, either water it down or even put in a different whiskey or mix it with another whiskey um, because it's just in a barrel. There's no, it's, it's very hard for consumers to, 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 to tell. Um, so it's really important at this time for them to have exclusive um, arrangements with local dealers 
to ensure consumers that they were actually getting the, the, the correct product. Advertisements, it's pretty obvious. Um, I've been talking about advertisements, advertisements already, but there's uh, economic theory that advertisements, the expenditure that you have to make to actually advertise your product, like at the Super Bowl, it's so expensive to do so, it actually sends a signal of quality to consumers because it wouldn't be worth it to spend that much on advertising if you didn't have a good product. So if you're just going out to, to, to engage in, in fraud, it wouldn't be worth it to buy a Super Bowl ad. Well, so newspaper ads, especially at this time, were very expensive, and they're the primary uh, way that people communicated at this time. Um, so it, it sent a signal of quality that they were um, willing to purchase an ad. Um, but some of the things that they advertised were really interesting. For instance, um, I, I found advertisements where they would um, actually ask customers to, to turn in any dealer selling them uh, selling a uh, product that they were misrepresenting. So if there was any concern on the part of consumers that, hey, you're getting something that um, isn't high quality and what you would expect from our distillery, let us know. And then we will actually advertise against that distiller and let everyone know that they're engaging in, in fraud and they're um, pretending to sell our product, but it's actually not pure uh, or it's not a product at all. Um, so that, that, that was pretty interesting. In fact, um, there's even um, one uh, distiller, Duffy's, that offered a $500 reward, which was a substantial amount at that time for anyone that turned in fraudulent dealers. The other thing that was kind of interesting was um, that they would advertise their specific grain bill. So what actually went into the manufacture of that product. And for some companies, they actually went into great detail about the exact process they used to manufacture their whiskey. In fact, it was so exact, exact that um, so here's my visual aid tonight. Um, Nelson's Greenbrier, it was manufactured as with the po most popular Tennessee whiskey prior to prohibition. So much more popular than um, Jack Daniels. Um, the, um, after with prohibition, they went under. Actually, Tennessee Im implemented prohibition even before that. They moved up to Kentucky and then when national prohibition uh, took place, that's when they officially went under. Um, and they never came back until just about um, 10, 15 years ago, the great, great, great grandsons of the, the head distiller, Charles Nelson, were driving through Nashville and they saw a historic plaque for the Nelson's Greenbrier whiskey. Like this is the site where the distillery used to be. And they're like, huh, I wonder if that is our, um, you know, our great, great, great grandfather. We heard he was somewhat in the liquor business or something like that. So they actually went through Ancestry.com. They found out they were related and were the direct descendants. And then they started doing some research on it and they found the exact recipe, the whole process. And this is what you see on the screen right here in a newspaper article um, because they invited the, the they, he would have a barbecue every year, invite people from um, Nashville out, including reporters and show them the entire um, process and what, into, what went into making the whiskey. And so they just published it in, the, in a Nashville newspaper. So they were actually, the, the great, great grandsons were able to use that recipe because it was so exact to restart up the distillery. And now they, of course, sell it again. Um, so we're able to, to taste what the most popular Tennessee whiskey tasted like um, back then today because they were, were, were doing this. Um, and, and keep in mind that the um, nutrition um, labeling laws weren't implemented in the United States until 1954 or somewhere around there. So this is way ahead of that time. These are companies saying, you know what, the, the, there's doubt among consumers about the quality of our product. We're just going to put that out there so that they're more assured of what's um, actually in this product. Um, so they're, they're realizing that the, the, that the fraudsters are a threat to their profits and, and innovating ways to overcome that. Um, the other thing they advertised was guarantees, and um, this was, was very common, both among dealers and distillers, saying, okay, if you're dissatisfied with this or, or it's not as represented, represented, bring it back and we will uh, fully refund you. Um, so once again, this is a common uh, mechanism that we see employed today to ensure consumers of quality being employed um, back then in this market. And of course, uh, the most important mechanism developed and most costly at that time was the use of glass bottles. This is the first, uh, what you see there is the first advertisement for whiskey featuring a glass bottle. Um, 
and you can see specifically that there's monkeys on it. And the reason that they, so they're, they're specifically advertising it as a way of no one can monkey around with what's in this product um, because of the, the, the bot, it's in a glass bottle and it's sealed. So they developed it specifically to ensure consumers of the quality that it was to the genuine product in that bottle because nobody could have messed with it. Um, so that was uh, uh, Old Forester whiskey um, that was first done like that. Um, and of course, bottling, uh, the mass production of bottle, whiskey bottles wasn't, um, a machine wasn't invented until 1903. Uh, so this was a very expensive signal for them to start doing. And Brown started doing it in 1870. So they're doing it for a long time and at a high expense to them to ensure cons consumers of that quality. Um, the other um, companies uh, I found, White Oak started um, featuring glass bottles in their advertisements, 1900, Golden Age, 1902, Cascade Pure Whiskey, which is actually, the, um, if, you, if you know of George Dickel Whiskey, that's from the Cascade Distillery, and that's, um, it eventually just changed the name, uh, but that's what that is. And then Jack Daniels started advertising with a bottle in 1904. Now, we're going to switch gears and now go to um, the rectified, um, those selling rectified whiskey. So there's accusations that um, these people were doing, you know, that, that there's a temptations there to um, water down the whiskey or use impure ingredients or just cheap products to, to flavor the whiskey and then sell it to consumers and misrepresent it. Um, but what we find in our research is that um, essentially these rectifiers were early mixologists. They were, they're like bartenders who are making the drink taste better uh, for their final consumers. So they took neutral spirits and they were able to bypass the very expensive aging process, put it in a barrel and aging it for several years. Um, took, a, took a lot of time and a, a lot of expense. And they were able to pass these cost savings on to consumers. Um, popular additives at this time included brown sugar, tea, prune juice, um, cherry juice, um, and they were actually very effective at removing and took a lot of care to remove dangerous natural fusel oil, uh, which was um, a, dangerous, a dangerous substance found in neutral alcohol. Um, so they, they, the recipes books actually give specific details on how to remove that fusel oil, um, to, and mainly because it, it gave a bad taste. And the recipe books also cautioned against the use of known dangerous dangerous ingredients such as nitrate and arsenic. So at the time we, we knew for certain that those um, were um, uh, very dangerous to you. And so they made sure to inform the trade book, trade books that had the recipes in them. And there are a couple different ones. They all said, don't use these dangerous ingredients. Um, and it was commonly advertised. So the, 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 the fear or the, you know, the story nowadays is that these rectifiers were selling it, uh, they're misrepresenting the product and selling it as um, pure straight whiskey. I find that that was not the case. It was commonly advertised as such by dealers and distillers saying, hey, yeah, we have real whiskey, straight whiskey. It's a little more expensive. And then we have rectified whiskey. That's uh, a little bit more, a little cheaper. Um, and you also had some of the most famous brands um, that we know of nowadays, such as Old Forester, Four Roses, Rip Van Winkle, and Weller, were originally rectifiers. So there's a lot of quality. There's more quality there than um, is, is understood in the, the, the common story nowadays um, that we find. Now we turn to, was it dangerous? Well, we did a thorough search of newspapers using the, the newspaper.com database we could not locate a single instance of harm, poisoning, sickness, or death from rectified whiskey um, from 1800 to 1920. We found cases of, of harm being reported in newspaper from fish, flour, coffee, um, a whole range of other things. We found a lot of newspaper clippings on diseased meat at that time and diseased milk. In fact, there were, there were um, New York City police actually had a, a, you know, larceny among their crimes that they listed, like larceny, um, burglary, um, you know, every, all, all the regular crimes that you think of, one of them was selling disease, dis, diseased meat. Um, so it clearly, if there was a problem with people selling um, dangerous whiskey, it would have been reported on at that time because it, we found this very common with, with other types of um, uh, poisonings um, and, and other types of food products that were made impure. 
In fact, um, newspapers did report <laughs> at that time, they actually thought that whiskey was a cure for snake bites and tarantula bites. So I actually found newspaper clippings reporting that um, like this person in Texas was cured, allegedly cured of a bite by, of a tarantula by drinking copious amounts of Robertson, uh, Robertson County whiskey. Um, pretty absurd now. And it wasn't until 1920 when I found an article where there's actually a 1920 article where a scientist actually went and studied, does whiskey cure snake bites and tarantula bites? And they're like, actually, guys, we were wrong. It doesn't. Um, so anyways, long roundabout way of saying that it, it, all likelihood would have been reported upon, especially with the temperance movement at that time. Um, the people, the temperance movement with the people, you know, especially women that were appalled by the, the dangers that whiskey represented to society and were trying to, to use the every tech uh, whatsoever to make whiskey illegal. Um, so they surely would have made, you know, if they could find one case of recti rectified whiskey being dangerous, they surely would have um, touted that as an example, but we just simply cannot find any. Um, when we looked at the ingredients, um, there were some dangerous um, ingredients used in the production of rectified whiskey. It is listed in recipe books um, for Irish and Scotch whiskeys and Old Roanoke and Tuscaloosa whiskey, as well as um, gin whiskeys used turpentine. Um, but they were the most popular whiskeys, such as um, the Lincoln County, Robertson County, and Bourbon County whiskeys did not list um, any of these dangerous ingredients. And those were the distillers that were primarily later on, those were the ones advocating for um, the, the legislation that would, uh, go, that would hurt the rectifiers. So the people with the most interest and in, the people that actually argued for the legislation, th there was no concern um, in, their in the whiskey that they were manufacturing that rectifiers were actually using um, in dangerous ingredients. Furthermore, um, Chris, the, the, these ingredients weren't recognized as being dangerous at that time. We go through newspaper, the newspaper archives, and we find it's commonly listed as a cure for toothaches, cancers, ulcers, bleeding nose, and it was commonly sold in drugstores alongside morphine, Epsom salt, and uh, cayenne pepper. Um, so once again, it, it's, yes, they, they did recommend it for a few types of rest, uh, whiskey, but it wasn't known at that time that it was actually dangerous. The first recorded death from creosote was in 1870, and, then, and it was because they applied it to teeth. And the newspaper article actually says, well, we know of no other case of harm. So this must be just some rare um, allergic reaction or something like that. Um, it wasn't until I think in like 1880, into the 1880s, 1890s, that we actually started seeing scientific evidence that, oh, creosote is bad. Um, and what we actually see is that creosote is actually dropped in the recipe books for Old, Ro uh, for, uh, Old Roanoke and Tuscaloosa whiskey. Um, it's retained for Irish and Scott whiskey. Um, but this is really interesting because if, if, if anyone had a right to complain of rectifiers um, you know, hurting the market for the whiskey, it was foreign producers, the Irish and Scott whiskey manufacturers, not the domestic, that's domestic manufacturers, but it was the domestic manufacturers asking for um, protection. And also at this time, it was really, it was really costly, even um, nearly impossible because of the cost. Um, to actually purchase Irish and Scotch whiskey in America because of the high tariff rate that it had on it, which was advocated by the American distillers. They, you know, they, they went and lobbied and got a really high tariff rate on um, Scotch and whiskey specifically so they wouldn't have to compete with them. And of course, then these, um, it was really hard to replicate without using uh, the, the creosote, the dangerous ingredient. Um, for turp turpentine, what I found was turpentine was, was indeed suggested, but it was suggested for destroying trace amounts of grain fusel oil. Uh, so it's actually a misguided attempt to increase the safety of the, of, of the gin, um, not to, to, to attempt to flavor it. Um, and turpentine, just like creosote, was commonly prescribed for medical purposes during this time. It was unknown that it was dangerous. Newspaper articles we find discuss turpentine pills and solutions being used as, to treat cancer, wounds, sores, burns, corns sore throats, um, et cetera. And we, we found a, there's even um, this prestigious doctor giving a, a lecture was actually recommending it, um, uh, the, the use of uh, turpentine to make cream and smooth, smooth uh, uh, gin. Um, so once again, 
Um, yes, it was a dangerous ingredient, but it was not known at that time um, that it was, um, uh, it was bad for consumers. Ultimately, um, the real motive for the protectionism was the self-interest of the distillers. Um, so in the market, in order to compete uh, for the business consumers, they had to develop these uh, mechanisms that assured consumers of the quality. In politics, their dishonesty actually translated into protectionist legislation, the Bottled and Bond Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act. Um, Bottled and Bond Act was uh, passed in 1897 and the Pure Food and Drug Act, I believe was 1903, is probably on the next slide anyways. Um, but they, they lobbied for these, le this legislation specifically to hurt the rectifiers, which were their cheap, uh, uh, the cheaper producers of whiskey that they were having uh, a lot of difficulty competing against. Because consumers were, a lot of consumers, especially price constrained consumers, were like, okay, it's, it's a neutral spirits that are flavored with like cherry juice. Okay, well, I'm going to buy that over paying much more for the, the aged um, natural uh, whiskey. So they went to government to try to, to force these rectifiers out of business. So the Bottle and Bond Act um, essentially had nothing to do with making rectified whiskey safer. What it did is it mandated that um, to be labeled straight whiskey, um, it must be aged four years in a government warehouse, must be manufactured in a single distillery in a single spring or fall, must be bottled at 100 proof with no mixing of different products, even if produced at the same distillery, and with the distillery information on the bottle, and it must contain a government stamp. Um, and, and you're now seeing a lot of um, a lot of distillers are trying to be innovative, and they're re reissuing the bottle and bond whiskey, um, which is meets these criteria, um, at least to some extent. Government doesn't operate warehouses anymore, and there's no more government stamps, but they are doing it at 100 proof. Um, you know, it's a cute way, way to sell um, new whiskey products to consumers. Um, but these, these provisions assur assured consumers of some aspects of quality of straight whiskey through a very complicated and costly regulatory procedure um, and got government into the certification business, but it did nothing to ensure consumers of the quality of rectified whiskey. Um, so what they're trying to do is, is say, our whiskey has this government imp imprimatur, this, this stamp of quality, and we're the only ones that can use the, 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 this, this label whiskey and we're the true uh, whiskey manufacturers. Um, and even worse was the Pure Food and Drug Act. And this enabled government to put labels such as imitation, impure, and adulterated on rectified whiskey, which offend, essentially ruined the rectified whiskey uh, business because they, weren't, they were honestly labeling it as rectified whiskey. Um, but when you start putting imitation or impure or, or adulterated whiskey on the bottle, um, that sends a negative um, connotation to consumers. And you see, um, you know, there's all sorts of modern label wars, um, like butter uh, manufacturers had against margarine. They took them to court and said, hey, you can't use the word butter on your product. Um, producers of milk have gone up against people that make rice or almond or pea milk and said, you can't use the word term milk because that, that misleads consumers. But really, it's about protectionism because they just don't want that to be at the label. Um, you're seeing all sorts of, of, of labeling wars emerging, but this is one of the, the original ones. Um, and, and as soon as the Pure Food and Drug Act was, packed, was passed, um, they immediately issued a ruling that um, said rectified uh, whiskey distillers had to um, put some of these restrictions on their labeling. And by the way, the person in charge of it, uh, uh, his last name was Wiley. He is the primary person um, in government that, that was um, promoting the adoption of both of these acts. He came from Kentucky from a family of straight distillers. Um, so there's a lot of you know, self-interest at work. And um, the only reason they were get, able to get both of these passed was a representative from Kentucky was promoted to um, uh, to the, uh, pr the Presidential Council of, Adv of Advisors and then was able to, to get this through in order to benefit their, their constituents in uh, Kentucky. So in conclusion, um, distillers engaging in the market were engaging in, you know, were forced to engage in honest behavior. And in the long run, even those distillers and rectifiers that engaged in dishonest behavior um, were weeded out of the market through that competition. So the, 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 mark, the, the, the structure of the market led to more honest behavior 
assuring consumers of quality and serving consumers. But their behavior in the, the, um, in the political part, uh, um, um, uh, the political uh, process ended up with the, the adoption of the tariff, which was protectionism, Bottle and Bond Act, the Pure Food and Drug Act, which artificially restricted competition and hurt their competitors and benefited their own bottom lines. Um, so same people engaging in dishonest behavior in markets and politics. In the market, they were led to actually engage in more honest behavior, and the and their dishonest behavior was unsuccessful. But in politics, their dishonest behavior was successful. All right, so thank you very much. I'll I'll stop sharing the screen, and I'll be happy to take your questions once I figure out how to do this. All oh right. wow, thirty people! Wow, <laughs> I <had> no idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Smith, uh, and, and that was a great, you know, super fun presentation, uh, especially as as someone who uh, perhaps enjoys uh, whiskey every now and then. It's always fun to know a little bit more about the industry that oh, there he's going to even uh, occasionally oh, yeah. <laughs> he's an occasional consumer of, of this product. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm going to actually uh, stop the recording now so that we can you know, have this, uh, this informal chat with, uh, with Dr.